it's one o'clock, so we are going to go. Um, and I'm going to say hello and greetings to everybody. Uh, a particular hello to all of our speakers, who I will introduce to you shortly. Um, I'm Manon, I'm the Development Director for the Major Projects Association. We do also have with us today Jonathan, who's uh, uh, just pressed the button to start recording this event, because we're going to record this and then put the content on our website for those people who weren't able to join us. So I'm going to click that, get off of that so that I can see my screen properly. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Uh, we also have Sasha with us today, who's been behind the scenes recording everything um, and sending out all your, all your personal details. So hi, Sasha, as well. Uh, so we're absolutely delighted to have Martin from AIMA, uh, Leila and Vessi from Deloitte um, presenting with us today. Martin is the Policy and External Affairs Director and Deputy Chief Exec at the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. He's going to be our first presenter. But then we've also got Leila Taki, uh, Head of Net Zero Transformation at, um, at Deloitte. Uh, and her work is very much focused on helping teams to transform uh, to deliver a net zero economy. Uh, and Vessi, of course, net zero transformation manager within that team at uh, at Deloitte and has a master's in environmental uh, environment and sustainability. So very, very well qualified, uh, all three to speak to us today. We just click to the next slide, uh, Vessi. I think we agreed that I was just going to briefly touch on this one. Uh, so what we're going to go through today is we're going to hear some insights from the, the Deloitte and IEMA report, um, a blueprint for green workforce transition that is now, you know, it was brought out last year. Um, I'm looking and I'm guessing somebody's going to say yes. Uh, and that's obviously there's quite been quite a few updates to that. So we're going to hear about that, hear about um, how, oh, good, good, thumbs up, how that's, um, how that's been developed. That thinking has been developed since it was the report came out. Matthew's going to do the scene setting for us, uh, and then we're going to hand over to Leila and Bessie to talk through the research findings in detail and to lead us through some of the tools that are available in the, in the toolkit part of the report. We've incorporated plenty of time for Q&A uh, and for discussion, um, so please do keep your queries to that point. Unless you've got a burning question, you can't quite understand, perhaps somebody's used an acronym and you just want that explained, in which case put your hand up and put it in the chat and we'll we'll try and capture that um, as we go along. So I'm going to hand over to Matthew to um, give us the contents of today's session and uh, set the scene. Thank you, Matthew. Great. Well, thank you, Manon. Um, and maybe just clarify, it's Martin this time. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I just um, firstly just like to say a, a warm thank you to MPA for organising this event and hello everybody. Um, and really the objectives that we set for this session are firstly uh, just trying to put into context um, where do green jobs and green skills fit in this overall transition, not just in terms of um, climate change and net zero, but also more broadly about some of the challenges that we face. And then I'll be handing over to uh, Leila because one of the things we want to do is to share our thinking on green skills. Um, and Leila will outline some of the research that we did, but also then we were really conscious that um, as we developed our work and our thinking, um, and there is quite a lot of literature being developed and uh, kind of ideas around this whole area, um, but also it's okay, well, what action can companies take and how can you start to do something about this? So um, Leila and then uh, Vessi will get into the tools and then just thinking about, you know, well, what does this mean in terms of uh, green skills and jobs with, um, you know, people working on major projects and, you know, hopefully we'll give an insight into the scale of the challenge that we have and what that might mean in terms of um, capacity and capability in terms of people resources. We go on to the next slide, please, uh, Vessi. So, yeah, a key thing here is just um, some of the language that we talk about because um, people get, um, people. you will often hear people talk about green jobs um, and sometimes a little less about green skills. And the work that we've been involved in, and if, if I kind of rewind the clock to, um, 2009, 2010, I gave evidence before an environmental audit select committee and they had a green jobs um, inquiry and we, 
you know, our, our view was very clear that actually the, you have to kind of think about how we're going to mainstream this across the whole economy and that kind of reaches into every job. And then they ran another inquiry back in 2021 and we gave evidence uh, before that inquiry and making the same points. And, you know, we use a, a shorthand um, in our email around all jobs greener. Um, and that was the focus of my evidence before the committee. And um, and I think off the back of that, then we we've, we we started our work with Deloitte on developing um, more research into this and the toolkit. So it's been a, a been a long journey for me personally. Uh, but actually, what's really exciting is that you know these ideas are taking hold, and there's a lot more action and traction in this area. So whereas we talk about green skills being that overall umbrella term um, for the technical skills, knowledge, behaviours and capabilities that are required to tackle this through all the work that needs to be done. Um, and if I just give an insight, you know, yes, we need people working on sustainable procurement, but we need all procurement to be sustainable. Yes, we need people working in eco design, but actually we need all engineering and product design to have sustainability and environment running through it if we're really going to be effective in um, encompassing, you know, the, the challenge of, uh, and tackling the challenges that we face. Now, what you often find is so so when we speak to businesses, businesses kind of really get that they understand that they think, well, how the hell do we do it? And that hopefully we'll give you insight into this. What you often find from a policy perspective is that people talk about green jobs. Um, one of the things that they like to do is to count um, and give numbers and targets and all the rest of it. And indeed, you know, by the end of 2020, there were roughly about 80,000 green jobs um, in the UK economy. Um, and so that's kind of gives a benchmark and there's many more that are needed in order to do the work that needs to be done to get us to uh, solving many of the challenges that we face. And I've got that on, a, on, on my next slide in a moment. But the Office of Nas National Statistics has very recently um, developed a formal definition of green jobs. Um, so employment in an activity that contributes to protecting or restoring the environment including those that mitigate or adapt to climate change. So, you know, if you're working in renewables, if you're working in, you know, whether it's offshore wind, onshore wind, solar, whether you're in hydro, whether you are helping to reconfigure the national grid in terms of um, being able to deal with intermittent supply, whether you're looking forward into hydrogen or carbon capture and storage and use, you know, those are very squarely green jobs. And clearly the people who work in the sustainability world are applying green skills and they're also in a green job, which is great. Um, uh, and then, of course, we have a whole set of green topics on some of the challenges that we're trying to deal with, whether it's um, restoration of nature and biodiversity, um, one of the key themes through the um, the government's Environment Act and subsequent environmental improvement plans. So not just halting the, the decline of the natural environment, but actually getting towards being a more restorative economy and, and tackling climate change and waste and pollution, etc. So that's the framing between and the distinction that we make between green skills and green jobs. If you go to the next slide, please. I see. Thanks. And there's been, you know, an increasing amount of action and activity um, by government in this area. So um, Green Jobs Task Force was commissioned um, to look into this and produced a, a detailed report. Um, but one of the things that um, IEMA called for in our evidence before the Environmental Audit Committee was that actually just having one-off reports um, missed the point that this is an incredibly dynamic situation in terms of how the labour market responds to the green challenges that we face. Um, and, and being able to plan in a systematic way the way in which we support both you know, the education and training system, the way in which we um, look at upskilling and reskilling people um, across the economy, that this needed to be a concerted effort. So the government has um, last year set up what's called the Green Jobs Delivery Group. And if you've had an opportunity to look into powering up Britain and the, the new uh, net zero plan, you'll see in there that already some of the that the work from that group has started to make its way into kind of core cool policy documents. Um, government has a target for 480,000 green jobs by 2030. 
and is looking at how we get there and the, and the challenges that that, that that kind of brings to the fore. Um, looking in different sectors, so what does this mean in terms of the transition for um, you know, mobility and transport? What does it mean in terms of our power sector? What does it mean in terms of industry, et cetera? So there are big kind of challenges that are being faced by all sectors of the economy as we, kind of move, as, as we move through this. Um, expect to see by um, early next year, so the government has given a commitment for a new net zero and nature workforce action plan. Um, and that's due to be published early in 2024. There's an action on IEMA um, to look at um, entry level qualifications into environmental management and environmental regulation in supporting this transition. But there's you know, others, others like IFATE, which is the Institute for Apprenticeships, um, who've got um, a big role to play as well in some of this and EU skills. So there are many collaborators and partners working to understand what has to happen in the whole skills development system, um, not just for people who are coming into employment, but also those who are already in employment uh, so that we can do this. So it's a big priority. It's also worth saying that this isn't just um, something that's happening in the UK. Um, if I look at the International Labour Organization, you know, they have a big program looking at you know, country green job transition plans and strategies, um, which they've been publishing. Because uh, and being out in um, in Sharm El Sheikh at the end of last year at COP27, you know there was a lot more um, thinking and action around you know how do we um, get into delivery modes and then you know a lot of discussion about um, technical. Um, education and training um, in order to get us there. Uh, and so, you know, I do think there's a lot of movement here. Uh, and clearly, you know, we are playing a, in a challenging situation with, um, you know, the labour market as it is, kind of, uh, and, and Layla, uh, Layla will touch on some of these aspects, but, you know, we are in a, a war for talent between different sectors in terms of sustainability, um, but also kind of in green jobs. And, you know, we're up against people, kind of the, the healthcare system and our welfare system and our hospitality system, kind of sectors all also fighting for people to be um, employed in those sectors. So, you know, there's a lot to play for. Hopefully we'll get to well past the 480,000 by 2030. So now I think uh, I, if we could just move on to the next slide, because one of the things from an IEMA perspective that we're conscious of is that um, there's no real single place that somebody can go to find out around actually how can you develop a green career. And for us, it's really important just from our own kind of self-awareness or, or self-identity as a, the professional body for people working in sustainability. But more to the point, actually, there's a coordinating and collaborative role that we can play in order to give insight into green careers and both enthusing young people to to take this um, th these routes, but also um, for people who might be career changers who's all, all already got a lot of business skills and actually want to pursue this. So um, the web links there, and I'll pop it into the chat shortly. But also we have a major kind of upgrade to the the site, or the the launch of the site on the fifteenth of June. So um, look after the, uh, look out for that when we get there. So now I'm going to hand over to Layla to give. A bit more in depth for well, to give the, the 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 detail on the the research and 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 an intro to the tools. Thanks, Martin. So I'll kick off just by telling you a little bit about how we arrived at these findings, because a number of you are probably wondering where they came from. So, so we did a, a mix of qual and quant research and a mix of individual interviews and workshop and working style sessions. Uh, and um, we drew on data from ONS around different um, careers that people have in the population in the UK, but also data from LinkedIn, looking at different recruitment trends over time. We held a couple of virtual roundtables, um, one with mixed public sector departments, one with mixed private organisations, and um, we went back to those individuals with a number of online interviews and uh, some additions on top of that. 
Alongside that, AIMA kindly uh, surveyed all of the, its membership. So we got a, a, a broad spectrum of opinion from people who have been thinking and developing um, sustainability specialist skills and um, roles for some time. And we did a, a rather large um, literature review of material that was already out there. On the basis of all of that, we felt really strongly that we wanted to do something that went from um, just thoughtware into actionable and usable material, which is where, where the toolkit really strongly plays. But we needed to frame up um, the context around that toolkit clearly as well, because as Martin said, still today, there are lots of different versions of definitions out there which we found were, were getting in the way of um, individuals in organisations and across organisations actually having the types of conversations that will drive momentum and drive action. Uh, all around the sustainability, climate and green space, the, what some of you may already be very familiar with in your day-to-day -day role is one person can mean green to want mean one thing and another another thing and you end up getting rather tangled and confused rather than driving sufficient pace and momentum and delivery going forwards so so in the material in the report we've got a, a summary of what um, we saw as the current state a year ago there has been progress but on an individual sector and organization basis uh, I think not as much as we would have liked to have seen, but that's kind of, um, there's been a lot going on for some organisations. We worked with all of those stakeholders and used all the analysis to paint a picture of what the future might look like, including characteristics of what a winning organisation would look like in a low carbon and sustainable economy. Uh, so moving away from thinking about this topic and the enablement of workforce and transformation from purely a risk and compliance and controls into an opportunity and value creation space, um, what does that look like for an individual organisation? And we have a whole load of case studies in the report of individual actions that different types of organisations are taking. Um, because what we found, and I'll, I'll go on to say more about this, is the, there is a limited number of organisations who are approaching this in a strategic and joined up way. But there is a number of ad hoc initiatives that are um, notable and useful to think about. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please. What we wanted to kick off this part of the section um, with first, though, is understanding how familiar you already are with uh, this topic to give us a sense of um, where to focus some of the um, voiceover in the findings and the, the toolkit as well. So you'll see on screen uh, a QR code if, if you're used to using QR codes or you can go into the web browser link there, menti.com. And it will ask you for a code, which we've also put on the screen there. So if you take a, a minute or so just to um, plug that code in or go to the QR code, we'll get a quick picture of different um, people on the call and how familiar you are with the topic. So right. I'll give people just a minute to join. Let me. share oh we've already got responses hopefully you can see my screen how many have we got on the call 23 so we're halfway manon were you about to come in no i i did a hand raise instead of a thumb up ah. <laughs> apologies so, so we've got a, a bit of a spread but actually uh, more people at the more emergent area of um, this understanding this topic space but the positive news and perhaps because of the title and who signed up is that we've everyone has 
at least got some awareness, which is really positive. When when we were doing some of our research, surprisingly to to us, and perhaps you might argue we would be surprised because we work in the space, and um, we found quite a number of people who hadn't thought about the topic at all, even in um, the government sector where the legally binding target for net zero has been set. Um, we did find representatives of government departments who hadn't thought about that net zero target in terms of impact on individuals and talent and skills um, the, and to deliver on uh, the transition to the net zero economy we are obviously going to need everyone in society to understand something so uh, if we move on to the next slide I'll start to um, tell you some of the things that we found explicitly. So, so there's a, an amount of material in, in the study. We won't go into it in too much detail, but we're going to give you some of the headlines now. So the research we did found that green skills are increasingly sought after. So one of the sound bites is that the LinkedIn data in particular showed us a double digit growth by contrast to a lot of other job profiles out there. So anyone who's already got those skills, it's good news. Anyone who's looking to develop those skills, it's a good time to do it and to and motor along doing it. Because there are an increase already of organisations looking for people with these skills and looking for um, jobs to focus in on this as well. So that, so that was something that we were able to see very clearly. Um, this was during a, a period where we we're coming out of COVID as well. So the strength of, of the um, growth was particularly notable. What we also saw through, through the various different bits of research is that the nature of sustainability professionals, those specialists working in organisations or in projects, is actually changing. Um, different sectors and different organisations are at different levels of maturity with this. Um, but what we're seeing is they are those specialist sustainability professionals or being asked to influence business model decisions and again be more strategic and be more about the enterprise at large whereas previously they may have been more technical or risk avoidance or standards and compliance roles i'll, I'll speak a bit more about what some of the um, specialists told us in, in just a few slides the next thing that we were able to validate, of course, most most of us involved in writing this report were we're trying to test and prove or disprove this hypothesis for ourselves. But we were able to see that um, this notion of every job greener um, and a green workforce is emerging um, and we can see a really clear trajectory and people from both specialist and non-specialist um, roles told us that they could see a future where everyone around them and themselves had a level of green skills. Um, so how do, are people do going to do this? We saw a number of different things, but if we go to the next um, set of points, what we found is there's plenty of examples out there um, where organisations are rolling out uh, education programmes. But one of the things that was often missing is a tailoring of that to individual parts of the workforce and a tailoring of any type of initiative that wasn't bottom up. So we saw lots of great examples, as I mentioned before, of ad hoc initiatives or function led initiatives, but not something that was designed as a strategic transformation and intervention. Um, and design tailored to the individual parts of what a workforce needs, but also what it does in driving and creating value and um, operational benefit for an organisation. And it was clear from, from the impacts that we were seeing where there were small examples of this that they, they will be required. So this one size fits, fits all approach is, is only going to get organisations and individuals so far. We need these, this tailoring to take effect. The other thing that we're able to um, validate and, and demonstrate is 
of course, there are many individuals in organisations, many of you probably on this call today, who are passionate and committed to developing themselves or applying the skills into any type of work so that um, sustainability and climate is threaded through every part of an operation. But that isn't the majority of people to, in the workforce today. And we are going to need to seriously realign incentives to persuade every organisation or worker to develop the green skills and to apply those green skills. There needs to be a really clear signal to every individual that this is of value to an organisation that um, it is a default expectation of everyone to some extent or another, and that you will get rewarded and recognised for that development and application of green skills. And then the final thing that we were able to articulate, um, and I'll come on to speak about this further, is there are a number of new jobs in emerging sectors, but also sectors where we may not yet be able to describe them. So quite often we um, use the reference point of us flipping from an analog economy to a digital economy. And that has taught us a number of lessons that we can see playing out again here, um, where there was a, at one point in time, we were talking about kind of career histories before, one point in time, you would never have realised that a software engineering developer or a game engineer um, developer were jobs that would exist but now we have many of those types of jobs in society around the digital space and we expect there will be similar jobs that we don't yet fully understand or have a label for that emerge with the shift to this new economy so moving to the next slide we talked before about trying to help people to be really clear about what's going on in order that we can all communicate and therefore all um, consciously and deliberately plan our strategic choices as we move into the, this new economy. And one part of that is identifying what shifts are underway. So these are four shifts that we identified. We've talked already about the expansion of uh, the sustainability specialist roles. So this is on the skills basis, but also where they're being asked to engage in an organisation. So, so as we are entering this economic um, status where green economy is the norm, there is this elevation of sustainability professionals to the C-suite. And we're, we're seeing C-suite level roles with C chief sustainability officer in the title, but also individuals being um, reporting to the board on a regular basis in a way that perhaps ne didn't happen before. We've got um, that increased need for green skills and non-specialist roles. Um, this is changing the ways of working for people who are in role functions such as finance, IT, all across the business. And again, we looked into the detail of this and they've got details per job family in the toolkit, which Fessy will talk about shortly. The the far right hand side, I was just talking about this, uh, the new sectors and new organisations and new types of jobs is another shift. But then the shift that has been happening for some time, perhaps without a recognition, is this shift from transition, transition jobs and unsustainable sectors into what is perceived at least to be sustainable jobs. Deloitte has for some years, for instance, run a millennial survey. And we have for a number of years had younger um, people coming into careers telling us that they want to work for values driven organisations. Now, um, that that is just one indicator of this having happened for a number of years, but we've not necessarily recognised this as a driving shift in and around the green skills and green economy, but it is there and it is happening. The final thing that we thought really important to, to um, keep abreast of in terms of this is that 80% of today's workforce will still be the workforce in 2030. And the reason this is important to remind ourselves of and to remind people that we're talking about these shifts to is it's very easy to think about these as things that, that will happen some way off in the future. But in actual fact, what we are seeing today is these shifts are already happening and might have been happening for some years in some cases. 
but equally for us to reach that um, transition space where organisations have the workforce skills they need by 2030, we have to invest now in initiatives because we all know how long it can take to educate and transform and put the right incentives and, um, and structures around individuals in order for them to be fully performing with a new set of skills. Um, when I started my career, I was doing lots of work in the digital transformation space, and I would say it took 10, 15, 20 years before I felt that I, I wasn't having to explain some of the more basic terms to, to individuals around me who weren't digital specialists. And we're going through a not dissimilar, again, tipping point with the shift to a green and sustainable economy. Go to the next slide, please. So I mentioned the specialist sustainability roles have been one of the points of change. So some of you on the call may, may self-identify yourself in this category and you might um, find that some of this is particularly resonating. So, so demand is increasing and will continue to increase for these types of roles as they will be required in every type of project, every type of programme to a greater or lesser extent. Of course, that demand is has risen up and that is being driven partially by regulation. But equally, we are seeing in our day to day work that organisations are looking to capture and create and stimulate value as a part of the shift to the uh, new economy. The role, therefore, is expanding. So we're going from those specialists being um, pure environmental specialists to being people who need to also understand what that means in the business context of driving value um, and the new opportunities that might come from some of the different aspects of sustainability. The other aspect of this is that it's flipping from people doing perhaps more day to day um, project work to driving transformation programs and influencing transformation programs across the whole of an enterprise. So historically, sustainability experts might have been asked to ensure that a particular singular project is compliant or the right standards are in place, whereas now um, they're being asked to influence whole scale transformation across an organisation. Um, you'll see on the right hand side some of the different things that people flagged as where they felt their skills needed to develop as specialists. So, so um, finance and having greater skills around finance, presentation skills and analytical skills, all mapping to that need to be able to communicate it with a, the enterprise and the C-suite and on the transformation basis in a very different way than perhaps they did before. So if we go on to the next slide, um, you'll see we've got a 77% of, of uh, sustainability man managers now reporting to the board at the time we were doing this survey. And a huge leap, partly because there were very few before, but a huge leap in the number of chief sustainability officers in Fortune 500 companies. It, for us, this all culminates in the uh, demonstrating a picture that um, not only do we need green skills in every job, but we need some people who are going to be change agents with a real C-suite level transformation focus. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. So what does this mean for everyone who isn't a specialist? So within the research, we spoke to a range of different people outside of those specialists' as ro roles as well and, and did an amount of desk research around it. And we found that um, green skills at the moment are typically in small number of functional teams, but there is a real appetite and a desire by the specialists and the non-specialists to really build those up in other places. The job functions that were felt to be the most immediate areas of gaps, you'll see in the chart, are finance, operations and procurement. Um, but it's very slim uh, difference, even into some of the other areas there as well. And there was general consensus amongst everyone we spoke to is that this is happening or will happen. And part of the challenge is knowing where to start. So if we go on to the next slide. 
since doing the work so the the study was about is about a year old we've just had our year anniversary i think um with we have found that there has been progress but it, there's still more to do um the some of the no points of note are organizations developing um and publishing workforce strategies so you'll see the national grid one there they were particularly advanced when we spoke to them so of course they, uh, they've moved um relatively rapidly towards this publishing uh, but it, they are a useful organisation to use as a benchmark. Um, we've seen local authorities also um, starting to take the green skills agenda seriously. So you can see uh, Northwest Net Zero Skills Plan called out here. There's also national um, net zero and green skills initiatives targeting individual professions where we have greatest gaps. So for instance, so solar installers and heat pump installers, there's various initiatives around those specifics as well. And we're seeing uh, educational institutes also further progress. So Cranfield in particular have got a really interesting vocational but academic course to cultivate net zero understanding and skills for um, experienced professionals as well. So all of this is going on around us and um, we're excited that if we go to the next slide, our toolkit that we included alongside the report still feels relevant and useful. So I'll hand over to Vessi to tell you more about that. Great stuff. Thanks, Leila. Um, so absolutely, um, in terms of all of our great insights from the report, what we really wanted to make sure is that um, those insights are taken forward, are practical, actionable. And so we developed a toolkit, which I will um, showcase with you today. It's a free open source toolkit on the Deloitte website, um, which we can share a link to in the chat. Um, so anybody can go along um, and have um, a go uh, with it. Uh, this toolkit um, is in two parts. So the first part um, looks at a maturity um, matrix. So um, it looks at identifying gaps in organisations, green um, skills, their capabilities. And then the second part is a model organisation of typical job families that you would find um, and really shows how you might want to embed um, some of the green skills within. The way that we've used um, this toolkit uh, generally is um, applying it and complementing it with other um, transformational programmes such as workforce transformations and human capital projects. Um, so it really brings together wider transformational work, um, which we've done with various different clients. In terms of um, deep diving into the toolkit itself, so the maturity matrix has um, two parts. The first part um, is all about assessing the readiness for that organisation to tackle green challenges such as climate change, um, natural resources, pollution and waste. Um, and along the top, you can assess yourself in terms of understanding the topic all the way through to leading and performing within that topic. Um, then the second part of the maturity matrix is really deep diving into the in internal capabilities of an organisation. So those job families such as HR, IT, finance, legal, that are enabling an organisation to embed green skills um, and to be thriving and performing um, for the green economy. So again, the maturity matrix is another opportunity to assess and to look at your organisation holistically um, and potentially to spot where um, continuous opportunities might be had. And then finally, the blueprint of a model organisation. Um, here we took 11 typical job families that you might have um, in an organisation and we mapped um, a public sector um, toolkit and a private sector toolkit, uh, knowing the nuances between the two sectors. Um, but generally looking at the uh, typical job families that you might have, such as HR, legal, IT, finance, we deep dived into each one and mapped the knowledge, um, technical skills, capabilities and behaviours 
that you might find. Again, keeping this toolkit quite broad um, across different organisations, across different sectors, our intention was to show how um, somebody might go about mapping green skills to their competency frameworks or to their job descriptions, for example. Um, so really our intention was to get a conversation going um, for different um, individuals or organisational leaders to take this and to think through how holistically they might be able to embed green skills into their organisation. We've got a couple of examples of job families here. But do go along to the website and explore the full toolkit um, to really see it in action. On the website, uh, we've turned the maturity matrices um, into quizzes to make it a little bit more interactive. So if you go through and answer a couple of these questions, you will get um, a results summary page which shows exactly where um, potential areas for improvement might be. Um, across various different um, green capabilities or green challenges that you might want to address as an organisation. So lots of um, top tips, ideas and suggestions um, packed inside the toolkit. So that was a whistle stop tour of the report insights and toolkit. Um, let's move on to some questions. If anyone has any questions in the chat, or if you'd like to put your hand up um, and we'll take those as well. Oh, Jonathan. We've got some hands. Yeah, we've got some hands, uh, Bessie. Jonathan, do you have a question? I do, yes. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued as to how we could integrate <coughs> this with the other developments that are happening. Obviously, we're now being asked to be data literate and to understand digital. Um, we're, we're struggling with the whole issue of hybrid working and different ways of working. We're understanding that in future we need to, to be more neurodiverse and more inclusive. And I wonder how we can kind of integrate green thinking into this so it's not not just another thing it's part of this whole process of of changing how we think about work really absolutely shall i um be question master um leila do you have any thoughts on that yeah so i mean one of the things that we we spent some time thinking about when we were preparing the report and there is a, a part of a section is the intersection of digital skills and green skills because they are linked um, they're linked in as much as a number of different technologies are either going to negatively or positively um, impact the environment and therefore um, it is useful to think about them together in, in the way that you've said. But equally, if you are rolling out any type of digital reskilling or retooling, um, it is a perfect opportunity to combine, as you say, rather than um, multiply your efforts, de-dupe them. Um, examples may, may well be when you are thinking about um, talking through cases, where you could have more green skills applied in a particular project or practitioner basis, make sure that those cases are digitally influenced as well. So, so if, if you are major, managing a major infrastructure project and you are using building information management tools and learning that as a digital technique, um, make sure that it references how you use building man management information to map and manage and monitor environmental aspects of any kind of building and infrastructure project. And there's lots of different examples like that. Most of the time, um, big organisations have um, health, safety and environment together managed under one system. So health, safety um, seem to map quite nicely, but um, Diversity and inclusion, I think, is is another area that is complementary to uh, 
net zero and sustainability. And I think, Martin, you've been looking into diversity and inclusion as part of IEMA. Yeah, I mean, firstly, thanks. I mean, it's a great question. And in, in terms of diversity and inclusivity, um, there was some research done in 2017, which suggested that the environment profession was the second least racially diverse after agriculture, um, which is, um, you know, a really significant um, challenge to, you know, to face up to and, and address. I, I think um, what's interesting is that, uh, and, and as part of our work in OIMA, we established what's called the Diverse Sustainability Initiative, which is there to drive, you know, a much greater inclusivity um, across a, a wide range of characteristics, not just race, but also, you know, class, gender, and various other things, um, to ensure that we build a profession that is both fit for the future and representative of the people who kind of need to be part of the solution. Um, what is interesting is that within our own membership, that's that, that, that kind of profile is very different. Um, and so for our under 40s, I think 15 to 16% of members in the UK are from non-white British heritage, but that doesn't mean that they don't face challenges. So that, that's something that we're kind of very alive to um, and, and are pushing. And actually it's something that in discussions with government, in particular looking in the power net and networks, kind of part of the green workforce transformation, that's something that is also being explored uh, uh, and being driven forward. I think more broadly on this issue around you know, how do we integrate digital, for example, into sustainability? I mean, digital is a massive part of the solution. You know, if I look at, you know, various sectors and the way in which they're tackling sustainability, you only have to look at agriculture and the way in which technology is driving, you know, much more effective and efficient use of herbicides, pesticides, um, in terms of you know smart technology drones cameras and all the rest of it um with massive both um kind of pesticide you know inputs uh side savings but also massive climate change benefits as well um and, and speaking to the government's digital data and technology leads of, on sustainability across government you know they recognize that sustainability uh, or they, they have a role to play as being part of the solution they also recognize they're part of the problem as well um, but but where I am encouraged is that integration of sustainability and environment into learning and development programs. You know, government um, in the run up to COP26 did publish a, an education, a climate, sustainability and climate change education strategy that looks across, you know, early years right through to lifelong learning. It looks at the the estate. You know, so what are the facilities that we're kind of educating people in and the transformation that they need to go through and how do we support those people who are teaching people with the skills to be able to do that as well so there's a much more holistic thought about how we bring this to bear the challenge is that we've got a massive infrastructure challenge between now and 2035 if the current government's you know transition for the net zero power sector is going to be realised and, you know, the role that hydrogen economy and that carbon capture storage and use will play in that um, if the kind of the pro pro trajectory is to be believed. And we just at the moment don't have enough people to do all the work that needs to be done. <laughs> and then so we have to kind of work faster and smarter and think about how we build the capability in people um, more quickly. We can't afford the time if it takes if it typically takes five years of experience to become effective in a role, we need to think about how we can do it in less than three years. So we and we can't shortcut capability and the ability to do the work, but equally we can't wait for the time to generally get that experience. So we have to kind of think about smarter ways of doing things and potentially technology helps us to do that. Excellent, thank you very much. Vessi, there's there's a there's a question from Rianne Lawton in the in the chat. If you wanted to pick that up, yeah, absolutely. So her question um, is around apprenticeships and current apprentices needing to potentially do extra uh, units to cover sustainability topics compared to new apprentices coming uh, down the line. Um, when might we see the the shift or the change? Is her question. Um, specifically from training providers. 
have we already seen a, a shift in apprentices? I, I would say that that shift is actually underway if I can jump in there because um, I don't know whether you, if you if you look on the IFATE website so IFATE is the um, is the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education so it kind of sits within um, DFE and if you look on apprenticeships and um, and the standards there's actually a button now that kind of says you know what are green apprenticeships and how do they kind of connect in what government is doing is looking across that landscape of uh, or not what government but what the I face and it has a kind of a green apprenticeships uh, working group is looking at how that can be integrated across now it hasn't got quite as far as saying every single stand occupational standard has to have an element of green in it they have taken a more um, selective approach to that but it is underway i think the big challenge with apprenticeships is that not enough employers are in taking apprenticeships as the route of building their workforce of the future and we have to find a way of um, accelerating that and, and scaling that up um, and that requires working in partnership with you know, education and skills provide training providers, as well as working through sector bodies like the MPA and others in order to drive that. Um, so, but we, we urgently need to do it because we know that in those some of those difficult sectors, like uh, difficult uh, job roles, like say electricians, there's a really high um, kind of transition from doing an electrician apprenticeship into somebody um, taking that as a career choice. If you go through an FE college and you don't have an apprenticeship, the chances of that person then becoming an electrician is significantly lower. Um, and they're training people to be electricians and then them not being electricians is not where we want to be. So um, kind of, there's still a lot to do on this, but you know, can, things are moving forward and T-levels look quite interesting as well in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely been a lot more uh, vocational apprenticeships, T-levels, compared to when I finished school and, you know, had was almost forced to go to university because that was the only pathway forward. Um, so positive to see. Um, anything else to add, Leila, on apprenticeships, workforce transformations? Oh, you're on mute. I guess just to address kind of education at large, really, I think a number of educational institutes are on a journey of transitioning and, and integrating the topics into their curriculum um, as, as a de facto as well. So there's obviously the, again, the specialist courses for people who are seeking to go into specific green jobs or specialist sustainability roles. But what we're starting to see more of is it being cross-referenced in other places as well. Um, the It's still early days, but it's coming. Yeah, I think we've got one more question uh, from Joanne. Do you want to come off mute and, and tell us? Oh, you're on mute. Hello, can you hey. hear me? Lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, th firstly, thank you for the session. It's um, been really, really interesting. Um, so uh, just a bit of background because it helped the context to my question. I'm the group sustainability manager for a specialist subcontractor in construction. So um, we're sort of an SMA, but probably on the slightly larger size. So there's about three companies in the group. We turn over 70 million in total There's about 200 employees. So that's the sort of yeah. level we're looking at. I've been in my role since January, quite new to it doing training with IEMA, which I'm really enjoying as well. So um, what I'm looking at at the moment is um, doing like a training matrix to identify the gaps in each specific job role. It's something I'm sort of coming up against as a bit of a challenge is that um, I'm the only person in the actual sustainability team. Um, so my time is very limited, but it's getting everyone else on, on board, trained up with these green skills, as you say, because you know, an estimator should be a sustainable estimator and a procurement person, yeah. you know, it's just procurement, but it's sustainable procurement. So um, I'm sort of, there's going to be some things I do have to make myself in terms of trainings, but I'm also wondering if there's any generic trainings out there that 
give a lot of background that I don't personally have to create myself because time is limited. So it's just wondering if you've got any experience with different the sort of training, I suppose, Aima might have some things, but if there's any different um, sort of general workforce things that can give a basis and then I can build the specific business topics on top of that. Well, there's an open door there for me, isn't there? So, uh, <laughs> I mean, we we do have a we do have a, a program of um, workforce awareness raising around um, environmental sustainability. So we have a program called Environmental Sustainability Skills for the Workforce, and we also have one aimed at managers as well because um, often they you know you, you need to get those on board <laughs> basically because yep. you know they have lots of different things that they need to get done and they need to see this as being one of their key objectives and priorities um, and they can very easily um let's say prevent kind of <laughs> what what your what your board and leaders are trying to deliver um and, and sometimes it kind of gets um in that layer of fudge so um there are plenty of different workforce development programs that you know i can share a link to in the chat in a moment um and, and i think it's from that though and, and the research that we that, that we kind of undertook with Deloitte was that when you move beyond that, then there's an element that you need to start to thinking about being a bit more bespoke. So the work that your procurement team need to go through in order to fully embed sustainability in the procurement process will be different than what the site managers might need um, in terms of you know some of the very specific knowledge and understanding and skill sets. So um, so whether it's, you know, preventing silts from, you know, sites which kind of companies often get prosecuted for um, because of bad site practices is not going to be the forefront of the training and support that you need to provide your procure procurement team. So that's when it starts to get a little bit more targeted in terms of how you need to get people to do their job. And sometimes you might need to start to develop some tools to enable them to do that and then train them on the tools in order that they can kind of apply that in, in a consistent way. But I mean, Leila, Bessie, you've probably got examples as well. Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of general um, topic videos and awareness videos. I'm sure you've already kind of got in your toolkit. And, and sometimes it's it's finding the one that's, right for your company culture um i think part of what is very interesting around this topic space is there is a whole range of open source material on all elements of the topic space but often people don't know um what's how to start that kind of education navigation the base the forming the base and having someone to do the curation either yourself or someone in the HR and training team who I'd encourage you to try to get engaged as well um, because it should be as much their job to educate as it is you as the sustainability lead because it's a de facto um, skill that everyone needs in much the same way as they're probably um, responsible for rolling out um, data compliance and health and safety compliance. So use the HR and training folks around you as well. Mm, OK, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, just to add on that, for me, it's about behaviour change um, as well. So having done you know, the training, how does that individual then apply it? What are the nudges? What are the um, communications? What is, what is the environment around them to enable them to take that um, education that they've done in the classroom forward into their role? Um, so I feel like education and uh, behaviour change go hand in hand. It's that continuous um, journey across the change loop, um, going from awareness, understanding, action to champion. Um, so you think about mm. some of the sort of champions network, some of the um, comms, some of the tools, apps um, that are going to get people to have those nudges on a day to day basis beyond the training that they've done, I don't know, two, three months ago. <laughs> I mean, I, I would get, I'm sorry, we, this is opening up a whole range of different um, elements of the conversation. So, thank you. Um, the, the, in, in, your, in any business environment, I think it is important to help people to go beyond the day to day 
incremental change around this topic space. So in a, in a construction business, what are you doing at a strategy level to signal, what is your leadership doing to signal that you do want to become, for instance, a, a leader in sustainable construction methods? Is that it baked into your strategy and your business model? Are, are you helping people to know that they don't have to be a race to the bottom with some of the pricing and helping them to feel like they've got the pricing support and structure in the business model in order to pitch a sustainable um, part of a construction model? Um, because without those business strategy uh, scaffolding and signalling, the 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 change will only ever be that small incremental piece mm, yeah i see it makes sense we've um we've done a sustainability strategy and have uh, that's sort of now what i'm rolling out and um i think communication is one thing that i was quite good at towards the end of last year as i was transitioning from my old role but as i've been full time in it since January there's just been so much on I've not really had the time to focus on that communication yeah. but that's come up a lot for me the last sort of three or four weeks that actually that communication piece is really yeah. important to signal that higher level strategy as you say you've put exactly. that really well exactly and we 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 try to help people to understand kind of we we're in a point where we believe actually sustainability strategies are dead um, because it should be a whole organisation strategy that is sustainable by design. Yeah. And that means actually um, taking the opportunity to speak to the executive about this being coming an incorporated part of the business model and strategy. Because it will, it, it, that is what will change the game. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for your question. Any other questions? I don't see any more in the chat, so maybe let's um, move on to the discussion part of this um, webinar. So we'd love to hear a bit more from you um, to see what sort of green skills um, you're implementing or doing, um, to see any um, that you're applying already or developing. Um, and to see some of the initiatives, training and support that organisations are offering. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, if you go back onto the mentee, the same um, mentee that you might have had open uh, previously, or if not, uh, scan the QR code, uh, use the code uh, to get back onto the mentee. First question uh, that we've got for the discussion, which green skills do you think should be essential for major project professionals? So these might be skills that you're currently doing or skills that you wish you had. Any skills that you think are essential? Collaboration, yes, big, big skill. Yeah, a few of the ones we've mentioned around procurement, that came up a lot actually in our um, research, especially around um, the social value, uh, the Cabinet Office social value uh, strategy that they have. I think procurement has sort of come into its own off the back of that. Partnership, yeah. Carbon awareness. Um, to Layla's point around strategic overview, so not just looking at individual skills, but looking at the vision, the holistic strategic overview. And if anyone wants to discuss any of these skills further, um, put your hand up and, and you can verbalise uh, some of the skills that you're also using. I love storytelling as well as a skill. I think everybody should should have storytelling right up at the top of their skill set in any job, I'm project management about, or otherwise. I'm curious about uncertainty, whoever popped that one in. Would you mind explaining? Uh, yeah, hi, that, that was me. It's sort of difficult in a word. What, what I meant by that was... First of my brain's still a bit foggy. I'm getting over flu, so perhaps I used the wrong word. Um, so I'm just getting a sympathy vote there. What I meant was, I suppose, uh, willingness to step into 
what is uncertain so yeah. a bit of risk taking you know it's a yeah. it's a bit of a, a journey isn't it we're, we're or maybe you not but a lot of us are going into areas that are outside of our comfort zone yeah. so that's that's kind of what I meant by uncertainty yeah I think it's a very astute point that actually people um in some professions um people have been used to knowing the um route from a to b in a very certain and unclear way um for many decades and years and all of these shifts are actually creating uncertainty where they haven't existed in in decades it is creating discomfort for some so the resilience the coping mechanisms that come with navigating ambiguity uncertainty potentially being the first or close to the first to do something in a different way yeah it's it is an important skill and I, i've seen this um applied actually in major projects around things like design for flexibility so we might know well we know we've got you know, a range of kind of weather um events and you know we design for storms of one in however many years 500 years a thousand years or whatever but we don't know quite when they're going to be or we don't know when a tipping point you know so you think about you know at what point do we need to um add you know height to the thames barrier well we know that that needs to be done pretty quickly but then we don't know when the next phase is going to be so how do you build flexibility into hard infrastructure design is maybe a, is, is a skill that particularly for this sector I think is really needed because our, our future has become more uncertain and yet we know that we need to kind of invest and build and do various things um, and where did those come together in a way in which you know and how do you apply skills and develop the skills to be able to do that um, when you don't know the answer um, then it's a you know that can that can be a challenge so yeah, I, th I think kind of the certain thing is having to prepare for multiple scenarios um, yeah. and therefore kind of having that ability to step back from the way it's always been done and think about the possible different lenses and different approaches is really critical. Absolutely. A few more in the chat around um, advocacy and coaching. Um, it really looks at sort of the softer skills I guess the leadership um, elements the facilitation um, but then mixed in with those hard skills about measurement and um, you know carbon literacy and project management so there, there's a real you know mix in there that a sustainability professional and a pro major projects professional needs to have I love Brilliant. sense making as well who he, he was who he had that one That was me. <laughs> I think um, I think design skills and um, you know, not just design thinking, but but um, wider skills associated with design um, and kind of future mapping and sense making, all, all of these things, helping helping people to imagine the kind of future that you're describing. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I, the thing that I thought you were also pointing out there is is making sense of the jargon because there is a lot of jargon around this stuff. On top of whatever jargon you might be dealing with in the particular major program, major project sense itself, um, you're adding further jargon. Yeah, lots of thumbs up for that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cool, let's move on to the next uh, question. So are there any green skills that you are applying to your work already or are in the process of developing? So any learning and development that you might be doing, any training, any apprenticeship schemes that you might be part of? Um, that's quite topical. I suspect there'll be lots of nods for IEMA qualifications that people have done. So 
So some people might have been inspired today to start looking, which is positive. And yeah, lots of, um, as Leila mentioned, lots of open source um, materials as well. So just looking online, reading, reading reports, um, going along to forums like this and learning about topics. Yeah, the nuclear understanding is that nuclear in in the the sense of nuclear or is it um being used as a descriptor <laughs> that's me man on um uh, and team um no a lot of the new um nuclear projects which are coming out small modular reactors things like that uh, are all coming with uh, a very green uh concept with them already and it's uh, how do we develop that and put the training in with the people who are involved yes yeah indeed brilliant anyone else want to share their experience of training developing their green skills especially um, whoever put the carbon literacy. Um, Joanne is interested, which industry is it relevant for? That course in particular, I think fr from my knowledge, it's a generic course um, it, about net zero. But Leila, do you so, know a bit more? So no, someone it specifically looks like they're developing an industry specific. Is that you, Alexander? Uh, yes. So the whole point behind carbon literacy is it's not a it's not a generic course it's meant to be relevant to the learners so I'm working with um, ECITB so engineering construction some industry training board and they look after eight okay. different sectors in the UK so they're developing a course for that um, I'm coming at it from a water water perspective trying to get sort of a water industry wide carbon literacy course developed Great. Well, one of the things that um, we talked about in, in the study was helping people to realise that while climate um, mitigation and carbon are really important topics, the other aspects of sustainability are, are interlinked. Um, water being a really interesting example because of resource scarcity and pollution and all of the other topics that might come along with it. Um, so just mentioning that because... Uh, for those of you who are newer to this this topic space, um, we can sometimes over index purely on talking about carbon without talking about the interlinked um, issues of biodiversity or even within the greenhouse gases. Methane is a particularly noxious um, gas, which is some uh, area that we are very underdeveloped on dealing with as a as a global economy at large. Yes. Yeah. That's tunnel, the one. Cast and tunnel <laughs> yeah, fishing. I like that. I've not seen that image before. Cool. In the chat. Brilliant. OK, uh, let's move on to our next question. So this one is what have been some of the initiatives, training or support offered? So looking for wider um, examples of um, things that you have come across either in your organisation or personally that have helped with your green skills journey or green jobs journey. And we've had quite a few examples throughout the presentation. So the Green Career Hub um, that Martin and Aima are uh, running with, a couple of training courses, but have there been any wider initiatives and support that you've come across? We've got carbon literacy and internal e-learning. So yeah, at Deloitte, we've we've got lots of internal e-learning hubs um, and rolling out uh, sustainability 101 training. So that's definitely um, helpful. We have a green champions network as well. Um, and we're signed up to events that we go along to um, so conferences, we look out for those in particular to hear the latest from industry. 
Um, oh, Manon, um, in the chat, hopefully someone will put the MPA Sustainability Ambassador Network. Yep, that's a really, really great place of like-minded individuals. Um, absolutely endorse that. Oh, yeah, definitely interesting to hear Supply Chain School. I've not heard of that one. Who put that one down? That was me again. So the Supply Chain Sustainability School has been founded for about, I think it was 10 years old. And it just offers free training because it's funded by partner organisations for your clients, your large tier ones. I'll pop a link in the chat. Amazing. And who is that for? Um, is it specifically for supply chain procurement professionals or anybody interested? It means anybody in the supply chain. So that's like 99.9% .9 of the UK population. Oh, wow. OK, very broad. I've done some bits with them as well, and um, the quality of their training is, yeah, really, really good. Oh, amazing. It's a really great sort of start of a tent to point people out. You do grow out of it when you've been in the industry for a few years, but as a start or moving into a, a broader role where you're not just focused on carbon, but need to start looking at waste, circular economy or biodiversity, then um, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good. Oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, lots of tips um, to share with others. Um, cool, yeah, others sharing. Uh, what else? Good links today, internal learning. Any others catching your eye? Martin, any others to add to? Um, yeah, we, we've been working with one of our corporate partners on a form of gamification. Um, with micro videos as well that's proving really really popular so different way in which people can access not really bite size but nibble size <laughs> elements um, which, which is interesting it's different ways in which people learn um, so I think you know the whole um, video gamification is quite an interesting way for, for people to do that um, and then where you get into far more depth um, is where you start to use video and augmented reality. Um, so I think that that immersive work where you can bring in a lot of different technical content um, is also a way in which people can be brought up to speed or, or, or develop their deep technical knowledge and skills um, is also interesting in area as well. And just building on this i know the question probably uh, is leading to this as a result that we're focusing a lot on the training side so some of the things that we've seen and kind of doing to ourselves as well and um, revolve around some of the business processes to to bake in sustainability and climate as part of the lenses thought about for instance at a business case stage or um at a kind of key performance indicator stage introducing triple bottom line metrics as part of standard business reporting um thinking about the as we talked before reviewing the organization whole strategy um from a sustainable um business models and future scenarios perspective and um, these were all really useful additional things that you can use to go beyond training and to put the wider enterprise architecture around the individuals as well. Yeah, absolutely. Lots more links um, in the chat as well. Um, thank you so much uh, to everyone's contributions. Last question um, from us. So this one is a broader future orientated one. So what could organisations, government, education and individuals do to better enable green workforce transition? What what is on your wish list, essentially? Martin, what would you like to see from government education? Anything radical that you've particularly come across? Well, I think radical would be policy stability, wouldn't it? I mean, that's what every business that I've kind of come across says. Just set the course and just like, let's get on with it, because that is the, you know, the, the thing that frustrates people most is when initiatives, um, whole change stop, get pulled earlier than expected, just be, just as people are ramping up investment. So I think that naturally leads people to be cautious. And then when you want to you know, encourage people to take on, for example, apprenticeships, you know, it can be a big commitment. 
And if you have that uncertainty, then um, then I think that's a challenge. And I think as well, just you know, getting the right um, content ready um, in, in that whole education piece. And you know, typically governments don't focus on this whole economy skills perspective. They tend to look at things um, in, in much through a much narrower lens. They look at you know too much. I think stops at the kind of the end of formal education. Um, and less across whole kind of reskilling, upskilling, reprofiling of your credentials. So I think there's more focus on that, and that's not just from government. You know, I think we all have a kind of a, a role to play in that. But a bit of consistency wouldn't go amiss. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and all of the um, sort of green job gaps that we might anticipate if we don't mobilise um, across this. Something that I heard in a talk that we went to together, Martin, um, at the All Party um, Parliamentary Group um, on this was maybe having a bit of a campaign, a bit like the army jobs or the navy jobs, having a campaign for um, electrical engineers, for example, to make the job exciting and something that you know, is really, really um, recognised and professionalised could be could be the way forward as well. I like that idea. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing on that is it's something that we, you know, the campaign that we're launching on the 15th of June will do quite, you know, quite a bit towards that. And it was really encouraging that the government's net zero growth plan referenced the Green Careers Hub and, and the work that we're doing to to build that into careers campaigns. I think the other one, just um, a, a shout out to something that Oima will be leading on and, and looking to um, do at scale is um, when it comes to climate change COPs, green skills, green jobs, green education, sustainability in terms of training doesn't get mentioned at all in the cover text and the conclusions. And so that's one of the things that we will be championing um, and every organisation on this call, we would hope we would be, you know, helping to get that that focus, because it's not just here in the UK, actually, it's all parts of the world where we need to have granular information and, uh, and but re a, a mobilisation of people into, you know, the future world of work, which is sustainable. Um, and we need to give people the the knowledge, understanding and capability to play that role. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of thumbs up, I can see from the rest. Any final thoughts, Leila, before we wrap up and I hand over um, back to Manon? No, just, just a shout out to everyone who shared something today. I think we all recognise that um, no one has all of the answers and we will create better versions of any answers that any individual party has by working together we'd love if anyone could see opportunities for us to work together with you um to hear from you brilliant what a brilliant summing up uh just in the last few minutes before i let you all go i'm going to just say a few final words um actually Vessi, if you pull up the the slide with some with the dates on it so um just before i launch into that please can you kind of Give me your virtual applause for um, for Vessi and Leila and Martin for running through a huge amount of content in a relatively small amount of time uh, and to do it so comprehensively. So many thanks to you three. Um, the links are in the chat. Uh, we will put the recording of this event online as well. So do please share that uh, beyond, you know, in, in, with a, across your organisations to make sure everybody knows about this. Uh, so we've got a few things coming up which uh, you may be interested in. So our next seminar is on the 17th of May about emerging markets, uh, which sounds as if it might not be relevant, but we're talking not just about geographical markets, but about sector markets as well. Um, we've got a spotlight on nuclear. Philip, I know you'll be interested in that. Um, head of uh, the UK nuclear market from Bechtel is speaking. Um, and also a spotlight on hydrogen. Um, from Dr. Zainab Kerben uh, from Future Energy GHD. So there'll be a bit of an, an element of what's going on within the sustainability uh, market mm -hmm. for everybody, uh, plus a few more other bits and pieces. We've got uh, the next day, so to the 18th of May, we've got our Early Careers Network. So anybody that considers themselves within that early career space, that's not you, Philip, sorry. I love you very much, but you're not in that 
you're not in that space. Um, it's an opportunity. Our, our Early Careers Network are really dynamic. Uh, they're creating a whole series of activities and events to help those people that are in the beginning of their careers to try and get that 360 view of what it's like to deliver a major project um, as quickly as possible. So we'll be talking about the importance of the business case in delivering a major project. On the 6th of June, uh, we've got a virtual member drop in. So anybody can come along, ask any questions about you know what it's like to be involved in MPA. So if this is a first event for you and you want to know more, uh, sign up for that. Sasha will get you all the details. Sign up for that and come along and just I'll tell you lots of things about MPA. Uh, and then another event on the 13th of June around sponsorship. Um, details are all on of our on our website. Thanks again to our speakers. Thanks to all of you for contributing. Cheerio.